So this is the second lecture in Unit 2, our electrochemistry unit, and this lecture is about voltaic, also called galvanic cells. Just like last time, what I want you to do is set your foundation by doing your learning targets before you watch this video. So you should um, stop the video in just a second once I get the learning targets up and use your book and set a foundation. Make sure that you leave space for some additions of things and we're definitely um, going to draw the diagram of a voltaic cell together. So here goes. So your learning targets for this time are all from section 21.2 in your textbook. And I tried to make it as specific as possible so that you're looking for very specific things. So pause the video here, get your learning target notes set up, leave a little bit of space, and then when you're finished, you can restart the video. So pause now. Okay, now that you have the introduction, you can restart the video. So let's see um, a quick review of what's happening here is that you pretty much will need an electro electrochemical reduction potential chart for everything that you do in electrochemistry. It drives all the decisions for what reactions are occurring and um, how much voltage would be required to make a reaction occur or how much voltage will be produced. So this is really important. You should have a paper copy from class, but if not, um, you can access it from the modules in Canvas. I do want you to know that um, when we do this now, we will be using this, and so uh, we'll keep pulling this out. Today we're going to talk about voltaic cells, which actually create electricity. So um, this means that they are spontaneous reactions and the overall reduction potential should be positive. And basically I put them together and the reaction occurs. And one of the things that you should have noticed in your learning targets, let me go back to this for a second, is that the biggest difference is that in a simple redox reaction that's a spontaneous redox reaction, usually the metals and the solutions are in contact with each other. So uh, like when you did the lab where we put the aluminum wire into the copper chloride solution that you saw the copper forming on the aluminum wire. Those electrons were a direct, a direct transfer. What we do in voltaic cells is we want to harness those electrons. So the two cells are separated so that the electrons have to go through the wire and through the ex external circuit in order for the reaction to occur. So because of the potential and the overall positive potential, basically our electrical potential is a, a positive situation for potential energy and the reaction will occur, the electrons just transfer through the wire. Right? So as we talk today, we're going to talk about some of the components of the half cells of voltaic cells and how it needs to be set up. We also are going to talk about the connection and we will talk about a few other things. We're going to talk about the salt bridge. We'll talk about um, how we draw this and what gets included and what happens if we have an active versus an inactive electrode. And in class, we'll work a lot with this. So please just make sure that you have your notes with you and we'll see what happens here. So uh, let's go ahead and see what we can do. All right. So as we look at this, I want to draw the cell diagram and talk about the components of a cell diagram for this voltaic cell. So I pulled this from your textbook. This is one of the follow-up problems um, or the sample problem that would have follow-up problems. So let's kind of read together. Draw a diagram that shows the balanced half cell and, and cell equations and then write the cell notation. So we'll follow that at the end for a voltaic cell that consists of a half cell with a chromium bar. So I'm going to highlight the things I need to see. A chromium bar in a chromium nitrate solution, that's chromium 3, and another half cell with a silver bar in silver nitrate solution. And they're using a potassium nitrate salt bridge. And so far, um, basically, they haven't given us any information. And if we didn't have a reduction potential chart, we would be in trouble. Um, but now they're going to tell us something that you should have picked up from what you've already done, that the chromium electrode is negative relative to the silver electrode. Okay, So um, this is kind of confusing between voltaic cells and electrolytic cells, but 
um, basically what's happening is that in a voltaic cell, because the reaction just occurs, at the um, site of oxidation, electrons build up. And when they build up too much, then they get sent on from that electrode, the anode, to the cathode, where there's a deficit of electrons because they're being taken in in that reaction. So where the electrons build up is where they're being released, and that makes that electrode negative. So what this right here is basically telling us is that the chromium electrode is negative, which means that the chromium electrode is the anode, which means it's the site of oxidation. Okay. Now, if I have my reduction potential chart, I don't need that piece of information, but sometimes um, we kind of make little puzzles out of this and you have to come up with different ways to do this. So I copied the reduction potential chart in here so that we could see as well that the silver has the more positive reduction potential, which means the silver will be the reduction and the chromium will have to be the oxidation. So this is like what we've already worked with in class. So I'm going to actually go ahead and rewrite the chromium reaction now as the oxidation and change it to an E of oxidation and make the sign positive as 0.74 volts. All right, so I'm going to ignore this reaction now because it's not really going to occur and instead the oxidation will occur in its place. And so the two half reactions that I have now for this voltaic cell will be the reduction of the silver ion and the oxidation of solid silver, right? or solid chromium, excuse me. So the next thing that I want to do now is set up my diagram. Now that I know what's happening, I'm going to set up my diagram. So these always look the same. You have two containers, usually we draw them kind of like beakers. And we have um, bars, which are electrodes. And even if it's an inert electrode, you have a metal bar there. We need that electrode there to conduct the electrons, the electricity. So without the metal bar, if it's an inactive um, situation where maybe you have a gas converting into um, ions, so like maybe in the case of chlorine gas converting into chloride ions, then neither of those is metal and neither of those would conduct electricity. So if your reaction doesn't have a metal in it, then you have to use a metal as your electrode. In this case, our electrodes are going to be the metals that are part of our reactions because both of them are metals. We have silver and we have chromium. So um, I'm going to actually do this backwards of what the book talks about because the book says that um, your anode is always on the left, that your oxidation is always on the left, but I want you to recognize that that is not necessarily the case. And College Board likes to switch things up, and if you were in the lab and you were just setting it up on the desk, it's kind of a 50-50 scenario if you don't know what's happening. So, so I'm going to actually not follow what the book says, and I'm going to make this side on the right my chromium. So I'm going to label my um, anode with chromium because that would be chromium metal and I'm going to label my cathode with silver because that would be silver metal and I'm going to connect them together with a wire and I'm going to run that wire through a voltmeter so that we can measure the voltage. All right, so the total voltage that we should see here, provided we're under standard conditions, would be, in my thoughts, the sum of the reduction potential from the silver ion plus the oxidation potential from the chromium. So the E cell, E standard for cell, or the standard reduction cell potential, sorry, the standard cell potential, would be the standard reduction potential plus the standard oxidation potential of our two half reactions. So in this case, that would be for the silver, positive 0 0.80 volts. And for the oxidation potential of the chromium, when I reversed it, I made it positive. So plus positive 74 volts, which gives me a total of positive 1.54 volts, which is now our standard cell potential. So if we're running this with standard conditions, remember that standard conditions would be 25 degrees Celsius, and our solutions will have to be one molar. We don't have any gases here, so we don't have to worry about pressure, but if we did, it would have to be at one atmosphere. If we run this at standard conditions, then that standard cell potential, that 1.54 volts, would be what we see initially as our voltage. Um, as this runs, of course, the concentrations will change, and so the voltage will also change. Uh, you'll see that it would drop.
as that occurs. So I just wanted to make sure that you recognize that that voltage is what you would see on your voltmeter. So the next thing that we, oops, sorry, the next thing that we do would be to add our salt bridge. And when we do this in um, lab, often we just use a string soaked in a solution of um, an electrolyte. In this case, they're telling us our electrolyte solution is potassium nitrate. So I'm gonna go ahead and label the potassium ions and the nitrate ions in my salt bridge. Um, and so I need to see that those two ions are there. And then of course, I'm gonna fill my beakers with electrolyte solutions. We always choose electrolyte solutions if we want it to be standard, it needs to be one molar. And our electrolyte solutions should contain the ions that are involved in our reaction. So in the silver half cell, I'm gonna add silver, usually the same anion as in our salt bridge, so I'm gonna add silver nitrate. So if I use one molar silver nitrate, and it dissolves in there, I'm gonna get one mole of silver ions and one mole of nitrate ions for every liter, and I'm gonna have those floating around in the beaker. It's the same thing over here. If I use one molar chromium-3 nitrate, and I put that in solution, then really what I'm gonna have is one mole of chromium ions and three moles of nitrate ions for every, um, liter of solution. So I won't be using a full liter, but that gives you an idea of what's happening. So those electrolyte solutions need to be in there. I'm also going to come back, I forgot to label for you, but something that you should be able to label here would be that this is the site of the oxidation. So that bar of metal, not the cell, but the bar of metal is your anode. And the bar of metal over here is your cathode. So remember that we have the two beakers, those would be our half cells. So if you want, you can label this as the oxidation half cell, and you can label the cathode cell or the silver side as the reduction half cell. All right, and these are just all things that we can go ahead and label. So now I need to do some other things. I need to picture what's gonna happen here, and I use my equations as a reference. So when I'm looking at the silver half reaction, I see that the silver ions are gathering electrons and turning into solid silver. And when I look at the chromium half cell, I see that the solid chromium is turning into chromium ions and electrons. So what I'm gonna notice is that the electrons are coming out of the anode. And this is something that you just sh could sh kind of recognize by now, but the electrons will be being given off by the reaction occurring at the anode, which means the electrons will be leaving the anode and heading through the voltmeter and through the wire over to the cathode. And this is always the case. Your book says this is left to right, but it's only left to right if you've written your, drawn your oxidation on the left. So my example, of course, I'm doing this to play um, difficult with you, but I definitely want you to see that it doesn't have to be on the left. So I can see the direction of electron flow from the anode to the cathode. As this occurs, what's gonna happen is that some of these chromium metal pieces will start to turn into chromium ions. And so we're gonna create more chromium ions as this occurs. And so what will happen is that slowly the size of our um, anode, in this case, because it is an active electrode, the size of our anode will shrink and you'll start to see that it will get eaten away at, okay? So instead of having the full size anode when we're finished, what happens is you end up with a smaller kind of chewed up looking anode at the end, and that's because the chromium is turning into chromium three ions. What's gonna happen on the other side is that the silver ions are going to turn into solid silver. So these silver ions will be added from the solution into, onto the silver electrode. And what you'll see there then is that that silver electrode will actually grow and gain mass because you're forming solid silver. So that electrode gets bigger. Um, and, and only of course, if it's an, um, a situation, well, 
only if it's a situation where you're creating the solid metal, let's put it that way. So on the cathode, it will grow if you're forming solid metal, and on the anode, it will shrink if your electrode is actually part of your, your anode is really part of your reaction. So these are some of the things that you should recognize, and this is kind of how it works. What this means is that if we're looking at our anode half cell, our oxidation half cell, the chromium ion concentration is continually getting bigger, right? So this concentration will continue to grow, um, and the molarity now will be more than one molar um, chromium-3 because we're gaining chromium-3 ions. What that does is this makes this side of this half cell really positive compared to where we started. And um, what will happen on the other side in the reduction half cell is that our silver ions are actually getting used up. And so over here as the, in the reduction half cell, the concentration of the silver ions will be less than they were as um, we started. And so, so this is really important because now there's a deficit of positive ions on that side. So this would stop before too long because we're going to have a situation where our electrical circuit becomes, um, there's just too many positive ions in the oxidation half cell and there's no way for any more positive ones to be given off. Or there's just not enough positive ions in our reduction half cell and the charge differential makes it so the electrons just cannot be attracted that direction. So the, ha the salt bridge is there to fix this problem. So what you'll see is that if my oxidation half cell is getting really, really positive because of all of these additional chromium-3 ions, then the anion, the nitrate in this case, in the salt bridge, will migrate through the salt bridge into the oxidation half cell or into the anode half cell. So the anion migrates to the anode or to that half cell. And then because we're losing positive ions over here and our silver ions are going and being converted to solid silver, the, the relative negative charge that's occurring in the reduction half cell, the positive ion in my salt bridge, the cat ion in my salt bridge, in this case that's the potassium, migrates to the cathode and toward that reduction half cell to equalize the charges. So the purpose of the salt bridge is to allow um, charge neutrality to continue as this reaction occurs so that the reaction doesn't stop. And if we take the salt bridge out, we actually see the voltage fall to zero um, pretty quickly because the b charge builds up really quickly. If you don't have a salt bridge there and you happen to be the one who sticks your fingers in both beakers, you would act as a way to try to complete the circuit and um, it would short circuit the cell or you would end up being um, the, you would feel a quick zap. Of course, this zap would be very small because picture that 1.54 volts is not very much and, um, and many of you have licked a nine volt battery so you get the idea of what that kind of charge feels like. So, so that's kind of the ideas that you should have as you're drawing this um, galvanic cell diagram. I want to make sure that I talked about everything that was in your learning targets here. So the components, um, we have that. We have how they're connected and the direction of electrons. We have the purpose of the salt bridge and which way the cations and anions flow. We have um, the difference, I talked about that, between an active and an inactive or inert electrode and that the inert electrode is there to conduct electricity when a metal is not part of the reaction. Um, we've drawn the diagram, so I think we've got everything included there. Um, the only thing I didn't put on was the actual reaction, so we'll do that. And then we need to talk about cell notation. So um, let's come back here. If I'm writing the reactions for these half cells and I want to include them in my half cell diagram, then I would come back down here and I would just rewrite what I have already written up above, that in the oxidation half cell we're taking chromium, and converting it to chromium-3 and 3 electrons. And in the reduction half cell, we're taking silver ions and adding an electron and converting it to solid silver. And now let's do cell notation for this. All right, so unlike what I just drew, cell notation always has the oxidation on the left. It also always has the actual electrodes um, on the outside edges, the far left, and the far right.
Okay, so if your electrode is part of your reaction, then you want to make sure that that solid is on the far left for the oxidation and on the far right for the reduction, which kind of makes sense because that's what's happening when you look at your equations, and I'll show you that in a second. If it's an inactive or inert electrode, you have to include the electrode, and then um, if you see in your book, and we'll do this together in class, you still include both halves of your reaction, but they're separated by commas because they're not part of your electrode. So we'll do that together in class. But what happens is that my oxidation is on the left, so this would be the chromium, and the single bar represents um, the separation between this is my anode and this is my electrolytes in solution or this is the ions that will be formed, okay? So this side is my anode. Um, and then I have this double bar that represents my salt bridge or the sides of my beakers. I kind of always picture it like that. And then I'm going to write my cathode reduction. Okay, so the anode comes here. My cathode reduction reaction is silver ions forming solid silver. So the cathode gets written on the outside. And we are finished. This Oh, and if it's something that's one molar or not one molar, we would need to include it. So sometimes you'll see this included in here as one molar written behind those um, so that you can tell. If it's not one molar, they almost always write it like that. If it is one molar when we begin, sometimes they leave it off. Um, and then finally, we need to balance the overall equation. So notice that if I'm going to do that, it does not affect the overall voltage, remember, but if I'm going to do that, I would have to multiply my silver half reaction by 3. So I would get 3 Ag plus plus a chromium yields 3 Ag and a chromium 3 plus, and that would be the overall. We already calculated the cell potential, um, and so I think this is everything. So basically, um, we will use this while we're together in class, and if you need to rewatch to draw or anything like that, um, make sure that you do that. Make sure that you come prepared in class with any questions you might have.